Okay. Hello, everyone, and good afternoon and welcome. Thank you for joining us today. Um, my name is Sonia Fernandez Arana. I'm the Let's Eat Healthy Program Manager, and I'd like to welcome you all for um, attending today's Let's Eat Healthy Community of Practice. Um, today's topic is Savor the Science, Functional Health Benefits of Everyday Foods. This webinar will examine the functional health benefits of foods and provide information on how nutrients and foods work synergistically to impact health. Um, next slide. As I shared earlier, my name is uh, Sonia Fernandez, and I will be the moderator for today's uh, webinar. Next slide, please. Just a few housekeeping um, just notes. Uh, we are muting everyone and kindly ask everyone to stay muted. There will be a discussion and networking part of our agenda. So as a reminder, um, if you're new to Zoom, audio connection is through your microphone or speakers of your computer or mobile device. If you're having difficulty, um, click on the arrow next to the mute button and select test speakers and microphone. Simply follow the prompts to connect to audio. Time has been reserved at the end of each speaker's presentation for questions and comments. And to submit questions or comments or compliments, uh, please chat those into the Zoom chat at any time during the webinar, and we will address those at the appropriate time. And uh, a link of the recording of this webinar and a copy of the presentation slides will be provided to all registered participants. Next slide. So for those that are just joining, um, we are asking you to please kindly uh, put your name in the chat as well as the agency that you're with and response to the question, how do you see food as medicine playing a role in your health? So I'd love to kind of just check out the chat to see who's all joining us today. Um, we see Norris School District, um, Altaloma School District. Oh my goodness, we have a lot of LAUSD, a lot of great community and school partners. So thank you everyone um, for your support and your you know participation today. Um, Rebecca from Norris says um, she believes food as food as medicine as being restorative, restorative properties. Um, and that, you know, it's supporting balanced diet and a good start to health. Um, Wonderful. We have CalFresh partners as well. So many wonderful, great partners. Um, well, thank you all for joining. So if you're just coming on, please, um, if you can't answer the chat, great. Um, if not, there'll be plenty of opportunity to connect um, on this topic. So next slide. Thank you, Bailey. Uh, for today's webinar, we will provide an overview of the community practice and its purpose in advancing the Dairy Council California's Let's Eat Healthy initiative. Um, our first presenter is Dr. Nadine Bronstein, presenting Breaking Down the Science of Functional Foods, and uh, she will present an overview of functional foods and how functional foods are defined and their benefits, as well as discuss some common myths about functional foods and provide guidance on how to distinguish between misleading um, claims and science-based benefits. Our second speaker is Rima El Mahmoun, uh, presenting Functional Foods Community Nutrition Application. Um, and Rima will address the application of that um, nutrition science and messaging uh, within a public health setting. But we'll also share best practices to educate diverse populations on the importance of um, healthy eating patterns. And there will be a facilitated breakout and the opportunity for us to connect with um, our peers and the Let's Eat Healthy uh, partners, our community, um, and also share your thoughts on today's webinar topic and how you may see yourself um, applying or could apply or maybe are applying um, the um, topic. Um, and we will also do a resource spotlight and that's to kind of support continued connection and learning on today's topic that can help advance your work. And in closing, uh, we'll gather your feedback, um, and uh, that will really help us improve future sessions uh, for upcoming community of practices, and also share uh, a date and time for, as well as the topic for our next one. So, next slide. Thank you. Our objectives for today's webinar um, are for participants to explore functional foods and identify sources and health benefits, discern between science-based benefits and misleading health claims, and um, an opportunity to network and to learn strategies to support healthy eating patterns. Next slide. 
But before I begin, I'd like to share just brief information on Dairy Council of California and its initiative, Let's Eat Healthy, for maybe some partners that are new to joining us or engaging with us. Um, for over a century, Dairy Council of California has collaborated alongside champions of diverse sectors um, to elevate the health of you know, children, families, and empower healthier communities. Uh, we are a collaborative nutrition organization working under the authority of California Department of Food and Agriculture and the California Dairy Community to support nutrition in schools and communities um, and you know, provide resources and tools to educate on the positive role that dairy plays in health. Next slide. And as I shared earlier, Let's Eat Healthy is powered by Dairy Council. Um, we work alongside champions, not just in California, but really beyond that. And that's really to engage in collaborations and uh, co-creations to identify sustainable solutions um, focused on um, enhancing access to science-based nutrition education that is culturally and age appropriate, um, expand dairy and cultural literacy and kind of farm to school or farm to table efforts, as well as enhance access to nutritious foods that include milk and dairy as part of the solution to achieving nutrition security and sustainable food systems. Um, and we are guided by our values, which are displayed on this slide. And these really provide the platform for us to effectively engage and leverage the expertise and resources of our Let's Eat Healthy partner community. So for today's you know, webinar, this really embarks um, the launch of Let's Eat Healthy's first community of practice. And the purpose is to provide our Let's Eat Healthy community a convening platform for partners like you to come together, network, share expertise, best practices, exchange ideas, all to strengthen really collective um, impact of our efforts in you know, advancing the strategic goals of Let's Eat Healthy. And we are honored to collaborate with two incredible um, Let's Eat Healthy partners and champions um, for this inaugural launch. And they will provide their expertise on the topic. And we look forward to partnering with all of you to really help us support the vision of these community of practices moving forward. So thank you all for being here today. Uh, next slide. And without further ado, I would like to present our first speaker, Dr. Uh, Bronstein. Um, Dr. Bronstein is a registered dietitian and associate professor and dietetic internship director at Sacramento State University. As the 2013-2014 Robert Wood Johnson Foundation Health Policy Fellow, she supported the 2015 U.S. Dietary Guidelines Advisory Committee. In California, Dr. Bronstein has served in um, volunteer leadership roles and, and is currently the Interim Vice President of Policy for the Cal California Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics. At Sac State, Dr. Bronstein teaches classes across subject areas, including nutrition and wellness, nutrition education and counseling, life cycle nutrition, a medical nutrition therapy, and nutrition policy. She received the 2023 Award for Excellence in Education from the California Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics. And Dr. Bronstein's presentation, Breaking Down the Science, will address research highlights and share an overview of the benefits of functional foods and how to differentiate um, between misleading health claims and uh, science-based benefits. So um, as a reminder, everyone will stay muted, um, but I would like to encourage you, if you have questions for Dr. Bronstein, please enter those in the chat um, and we will address those uh, you know, at the end of her presentation. So welcome, Dr. Bronstein. Thank you, everyone, for coming. And I'm excited to be part of this, you know, new adventure that the Let's Eat Healthy is going to be embarking on. So thank you so much. Next slide, please. So I want uh, participants for you uh, to identify at least one food in each of the major food groups that are considered to be a functional food because they contain a bioactive compound that promotes health. You can distinguish between a probiotic and a prebiotic and can explain perhaps why a food matrix approach to understanding the benefits of foods is better than focusing on one individual nutrient. I realize as Sonia has just uh, asked, mentioned that I would be talking about the health claims. I don't have specific uh, slides in here, but I definitely can talk about that um, at the end as well, about distinguishing between the health claims that are okay and not. That's all depending okay. So the next slide, please, Bailey. 
So we, we're going to be having a few polls. And I think that in the beginning of a, uh, a webinar like this or any class that you teach, who's here? And just check one um, so we can get a sense of who's in the audience today. Thanks for participating. Sometimes you need to kind of get warmed up. And at least we want, we want to engage you and make it more active than passive. Okay, so we have a lot of community nutrition professionals, some K-12, to and some other. So if you didn't feel that you were, uh, you were represented, if you, you've already been doing a great job of putting in the uh, chat what, uh, what you represent, and so feel free to add that in there too. So thanks so much. Uh, the next slide. I have three, three polls questions right in the beginning. How would you rate your, your knowledge of functional foods? I have expert knowledge. I know a lot. I know a little. It's all new to me, and I'd like to know more. Thank you. So we have some who have experts, a lot uh, knowing a little bit about it, a little bit new. So great. We have sort of a nice bell-shaped curve of of knowledge. Thank you so much. And I have one last question to get you warmed up to the topic. This poll allows you to choose more than one. And so choose three foods that you happen to like. It's kind of nice to think about as a dietitian, dietitians have a, a bad reputation of telling people what they should not eat. And I always really like to help people think about the foods that they can eat more and more frequently, a lot of berries, oats, yogurt, salmon, yum. Well, you are, you are going to be very happy to know that all of these foods are considered functional foods. So just keep enjoying them. And then we're going to get into some of the science now. So the FDA does not have a legal definition, a definition that they go by that for functional food. Um, the Institute for Food Technologists, I want to explain that, um, and I say it a little, I say it several times. I'm going to be focusing today about food, not food additives, um, because as food technology people, they have their definition because they are trying to create foods and add uh, these components that make them would make them more healthy. So the food technologists look at functional foods as conventional foods where a specific component has been added to target a physiologic function and that they feel that that then provides a health benefit beyond basic nutrition. But in the next slide, you, you'll see that um, that the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics had, I'm, I have to say it in the past tense, they have um, uh, position papers and they're in existence for years and if they don't update them, retire them. But I still feel that this definition is really very helpful that uh, that functional foods are whole foods along with fortified, enriched, or enhanced that have a potentially beneficial effect on health when it's consumed as part of a varied diet. And that uh, all foods are essentially functional at some level because they provide energy and protein, fats, and carbohydrates and minerals. But um, that some food components that are not exactly considered nutrients in the traditional sense that um, we'll see that another term that is used is called bioactives, that uh, they contain some of these components and that's where they're called functional foods. So kind of keep in mind that, um, that the food technology Things, they may call they may call the functional foods that they're creating nutraceuticals. But I'm really I want us as food professionals to be thinking about foods. So that's where I'm directing my focus today. Next slide, please. And these are some of the things that these functional foods, these components in the foods we eat can do to help keep us healthy. They can lower cholesterol and triglycerides. They promote heart health, reduce blood pressure, reduce types of cancers, promote immune function and gut health. So there are many ways that 
the foods that we eat can help keep us healthy. Next. So some of the compounds, bioactive compounds are prebiotics and probiotics and polyphenols and beta-glucan fiber and flavonoids, allicin, quercetin, phytosterols, lycopene, omega-3 fatty acids. And once again, this isn't every single bioactive compound, but these are some that you might hear of, you might, um, you might think of when you're, um, you know, especially if you're going to be doing, uh, doing some community education, or sometimes people kind of raise their hand, because I've, uh, this has happened to me many times, people say, well, what is that compound? What does it do? And, you know, can you give me a name? Because some people are really eager to go read and, you know, with our, with our phones as computers, we can learn a lot. So these are some words you might, you might see. I'd like to define, and this is one of my objectives of the presentation, we hear the term probiotics and prebiotics. And I want you to be able to discern the difference. And these, these definitions come from the Office of Dietary Supplements at NIH, okay. and they have some good, uh, good fact sheets. There are fact sheets for consumers that I want you to be aware of, and also for health professionals. And so take advantage of the uh, materials that they have. So the, um, the International Scientific Association for Prebiotics and Probiotics and Prebiotics define probiotics as live microorganisms that when administered in adequate amounts confer health benefit on these microorganisms, which consist mainly of bacteria, but also include yeasts, are naturally present in fermented foods. So there's some important words there that we see that the adequate amount, there might be, um, you know, a live microorganism, but if the, if the dose is too small, it's not going to be able to confer the benefit that, um, that we're looking for. Um, they're microorganisms. And that what's really interesting is they're naturally present in fermented foods. So you'll be thinking, well, I need to be thinking about what fermented foods am I aware of? Whereas prebiotics, well, the probiotics have to grow and thrive. The prebiotics um, are typically complex carbohydrates and the inulin they're, they're just terms you might find inulin that, that have been added to some products like yogurt or whatever that help give it some extra fiber um, or other fructooligosaccharides that the microorganisms use in the GI tract for fuel. So there's this nice balance between the uh, one of a colleague years ago, I heard her do a presentation and she called the probiotics, the good gut guys. And there's a they're the they're the uh, microorganisms that are doing this great work to help keep us our immune system strong but they need food they need to eat just like we do so on the next slide we'll be I get to see what are some examples of probiotic foods and what are and, and some prebiotic foods so remember the word was fermented so then uh, sauerkrauts are fermented kimchi Kombucha also is a fermented product. Kefir, labna, and we'll be seeing some more of that later. In some aged and soft cheeses, um, the thing that they just can't get to be overheated. So that's even when you make yogurt, you have to make sure that the um, that the temperature when you're making it. I, I've made yogurt. I buy it most of the time, but every once in a while, I feel like I want to make it myself. And so they're very, very important instructions to not overheat it it's because you need to make sure that the, um, the, the good gut guys, the good bacteria are not killed in the process of the heating. But all of those uh, bacteria need, need food to, to uh, fuel. Here are some examples, examples of foods that, that you probably include in your diet all the time. So there's this nice synergistic balance with, um, with all of these, the, the, what the um, probiotics 
and the prebiotics. Next. So what I'm going to do is go through in these, these next slides, some of the, some of, in the food categories and what are some of the, um, you know, what are some of the functional food characteristics and the uh, bioactives that are in them. I have, uh, you will see, there are a lot of food pictures in here. And I've, uh, if a food picture doesn't have an attribution like this one here, it's a picture that I've taken. So, uh, but all the others, if I've taken them from someplace, you'll see where it comes from. So let's go see. Let's think about those, those, those yum, yummy uh, foods. Now, when we think about, we think about vegetables, like, you know, tomatoes. Well, tomatoes, when they're, when the tomatoes are uh, cooked and heated, especially with some oil, um, that they contain lycopene and lycopene is important. Um, it's what gives the, it gives the tomatoes this beautiful red color. And that is that's important because uh, when you heat it and you add the fat, it helps uh, carry the lycopene to the th throughout the body and helps pre prevent prostate cancer. So I'm just thinking wonderful tomatoes that we'll get in the summer that are grown right uh, right here in California. Mushrooms. Now th that's it's not all the mushrooms particularly, but if you look in the far right corner of the um of the the picture you see those little shiitake mushrooms and the shiitake mushrooms um the they have beta glucan fiber in it and that uh, the beta glucans that are in shiitake mushrooms oats and barley even though those are in a, a future slide in for grains help um help absorb the um, uh, as a soluble fiber absorb the cholesterol so these are you know shiitake mushrooms we see them all the time we also we often see them in japanese and chinese uh, recipes so um and there's probably some other health benefits for all those other mushrooms too but the ones that i'm most familiar with with heart disease are the shiitakes and the same on the right, we have um, onions and onions and garlic. <clears throat> the um, <clears throat> there, the onions have. Um, oh, I'm trying to think. Al and the and the garlic particularly have have something called allicin. Allicin is a um, is one of those bioactive compounds that lower your blood cholesterol. So. Almost, almost everywhere you go around the world, people are eating people are eating onions, and onions. What's really great about them? They can be stored very well, stored for a long time. And as a and one of the things that Sonia didn't mention, I worked in the in the cardiac rehab program at the Massachusetts General Hospital in uh, the late 1980s and the early 1990s and uh till till 19 till 1988 uh, 84 rather um so anyway i um we when we were to, we did some heart healthy cooking classes with our uh with participants who were in the cardiac rehab program so just as i had mentioned earlier i said i <clears throat> I wanted to encourage our patients to be thinking about foods they could eat more of. So I would give them this list of foods that lower your blood cholesterol and, uh, you know, onions and garlic and apples and pears and carrots and um, fish. So all these foods, rather than thinking, don't, 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 if you could think about how you could eat more of them and how could you include, where could you include onions more in your diet? Where could you in incorporate those um, mushrooms? I would think about, wouldn't it be great to, to make a wonderful lentil stew because of the legumes that has onions and garlic and mushrooms and carrots and, and lentils? Make this wonderful, wonderful, tasty soup. Because remember, people eat food, they don't eat nutrition. And that's where you as the nutrition professional in trying to think about how to offer these foods and uh, K-12 uh, 
schools when you're communicating with patients, with your participants and your CalFresh. And if you're just counseling patients somewhere, being able to communicate that and communicate the why. Um, lots of times people like to know the why they should be eating something because that helps them, gives them that self-efficacy that they could make the, make the change, not to just that they should or shouldn't, but they know the why, so they're more motivated to um, incorporate those foods. Let's go on to the next slide. Ah, fruits, fruits, those beautiful, you know, here we are in California, wonderful, uh, you know, oranges. And so, you know, when you're peeling an orange and then you have the, the little white stringy stuff, those have us the bioflavonoids. And those are so wonderful at helping lower blood cholesterol. Apples and pears, the berries, the berries also have the the um, the the flavonoids and grapes. Grapes have something called resveratrol, and that's when grapes become um, are, are made into wine. That's really very important. I actually have to tell you that my plan for tonight, I am making an apple pear crisp. And so, and there will be oats on the top, uh, almonds and walnuts, which you're going to see. I'm giving you a little sneak preview. But these are ways that you can incorporate these foods um, into everything that you eat. Let's go on to the next one. Dairy. And I wanted to show, the. I have eaten this kind of Indian style yogurt. And it's really fun to try different kinds of yogurts. They're slightly different. And notice in the ingredient list, this says contain six live active probiotic cultures. And it's telling you which ones that they are. And so that I think is really very helpful in educating and educating your patients, your participants, your family, your neighbors, the kids. I had mentioned earlier that I have made my own yogurt in the upper left-hand corner as an example of that. You know, you can also use, if you have a dehydrator, the dehydrator that I has, have has a um, yogurt setting that will keep the temperature steady. You don't need to do that at all. You can just make it in your in your oven that's warm. Abna is kind of like yogurt. It's wonderful. It's a, a Middle Eastern. Um, it's used in Middle Eastern cuisine. Um, and the below that is an aged cheese. Not all aged cheeses or all soft cheeses have probiotics in them, but some do if they're not if they're not overheated. So Swiss is an example. On the top right hand in the slide is kefir. Kefir is like a like a liquid yogurt drink that has these live and active cultures in it. It sometimes has a little tang to it. And so um, those would be th that may be something that you want to, you know, consider. And sometimes when we're thinking and, and Rima will talk about this, about ways to be culturally appropriate, incorporating foods and having food pictures of brands or things that um that you're going to, that you have. And then on the right is um, some cottage cheese. So let's go on to the next. So as I had mentioned earlier, the food matrix, it includes the protein, fat, carbohydrates, but these bioactives, these, these functional foods, uh, chemicals that we had talked about. So let's go on to the next slide. You have more foods to talk about. The protein foods, the salmon, uh, you know, that could be uh, a, a raw salmon in a sushi or on a on a plank if you're grilling it. Um, eggs have something called choline. Choline is very, very important uh, bioactive uh, nutrient that is important for brain health. And we're we see that in thinking about elders, that brain health is important. Your almonds and walnuts, they have... Um, omega-3 oils and the fibers, as well as, you know, and almonds are also a good source of uh, calcium, your beans and your legumes. So there are ways that you can find foods in all the food groups. Next. And in grains, 
Um, I had the chance to go to the Bob's, Bob's Red Mill uh, factory up in Oregon. And so there are different kinds of greens that have different fibers in the left hand, uh, the left hand bottom oats. I had mentioned that earlier in making an apple pear crisp with oats on the top, or in the, the middle there is an overnight oats that you could then incorporate some of the berries and the other foods that are um that have the, the functional food char char characteristic. Other foods like avocados. Avocados are a very good source of monounsaturated fat, and they they're good for lowering your cholesterol. The garlic that I had mentioned before with the um, allicin, um, olives, and olive oil is very important. There are factors in olive oil, not that it's just mainly a monounsaturated fat, but there are also chemical properties that make your blood platelets less sticky. And if your blood platelets are less sticky, there's less of a chance for a fatal or non-fatal blockage or heart attack that could happen. So that's another reason. Now, I want to say there, there are many other foods that have other components, but I only have 20 minutes today. Next slide, a few little questions here. Myth versus fact. Does an apple a day keep the doctor away? Well, research does say that, you know, if you, if, if, when I did some looking up that, well, not exactly, but apple also has pectin and that fiber that helps absorb that extra cholesterol. Apples are also a good source of boron. Boron is also important for bone health. So, so could an apple a day keep the doctor away? Well, possibly, but I would say eating a, uh, there's a friend of mine's mother was in her 90s and I asked her what was her key to long life. And she says, I uh, take some walk, she drinks a glass of milk every day and she eats a piece of fresh fruit. So sometimes, you know, that's just a little anecdotal, but she was, Margaret was doing. Eggs are bad for your health. Um, eggs, we used to think, oh, they're so high in cholesterol. Well, it's not the cholesterol in the foods that raise your blood cholesterol. It's the saturated fat. And, and eggs also have a good source of that choline that I had mentioned earlier. So not really. That is not the, I would say, no, eggs are not bad for your health. And great source of protein. We compare all proteins to egg protein. And eating a low-fat diet is best for heart health. Back in the 1980s, that's what I was promoting when I was working at the Mass General Hospital. We know a lot more. And the qual the kind of fat you're eating, incorporating more monounsaturated fats that are coming from nuts and from avocados and from olive oil, those things are actually very, very good for your health. To the next slide. Once again, I want to get back to reminding you that it's the combination of all the things and all the foods together. And it's not just, um, you know, one food or one nutrient that's important. It's about what we put all together that matters. Let's go on to the next slide. So I just, in summary, remember people eat food, they don't eat nutrition. And the diet contains a, that contains a variety of foods that are minimally processed uh, promotes health and gut and cardiovascular, your immune system, cancer prevention, and the bioactive compounds that we've talked about using that matrix approach is really, is really great. And that the probiotics are in the fermented foods and the prebiotics are the, are the fuel for the. Next. So here are just some resources, and uh, the, there's a very, very nice summary about functional foods for health from the Co Colorado Cooperative Extension, the food matrix, um, about that foods are more than a sum of its nutrients, and the uh, NIH Office of Dietary Supplements Consumer Fact Sheet. So hopefully those can be helpful as you uh, try to take this and apply it at home. And that's my contact information. Please feel free to reach out. Thank you.
Thank you, Dr. Bronstein, for sharing valuable information with us and, you know, providing a foundation for understanding functional foods and just, you know, the nutritional outcomes and benefits. Um, just in the interest of time, we will address questions for both speakers um, at the end after they have, um, you know, each presented. So next slide, please. Thank you. Um, our next speaker is Rima El Mahoun. Um, Rima is a registered dietitian nutritionist and the CalFresh Healthy Living Project Director for the Cal for the California Department of Public Health, Nutrition Education, Obesity Prevention Branch, known as NEOP, with Solano County uh, Public Health. As a project director, Rima coordinates um, efforts between state and local level community partners who promote healthy. Um, eating and active living to low-income residents through um, advocacy, environmental change, collaboration, resource sharing, and education. Rima represents one of three um, CalFresh Healthy Living implementing agencies within Solano County who use multiple um, venues to facilitate behavior change in homes, schools, work sites, and communities to create environments that support healthy lifestyles and equitable access to safe, healthy, affordable culturally diverse foods and beverages in Solano County. Uh, now I'd like to welcome Rima. Thank you, Sonia. And thank you, Dairy Council, for inviting me today. Um, I am just going to go ahead and jump in. So I'm going to be talking about the community nutrition application, about functional foods. Um, next slide. So I just wanted to start by acknowledging the different roles of dietitians here in our health and social services department. So we have in the clinical sphere dietitians that provide outpatient one-on-one -on -one nutrition counseling, i.e. the medical nutrition therapy to our family health and behavioral health patients. We also have our WIC dietitians who work with low income or income eligible pregnant breastfeeding and non-breastfeeding women and children under the age of five. And finally, um, CalFresh Healthy Living Dietitians, we work in the community with um, income eligible populations in various settings and provide nutrition education and physical activity promotion. Next slide. So one of the most important aspects when working with any group of people really is understanding your audience. So when you understand your audience um, and what their needs are, it ensures that the message we're providing is relevant and reasonable and feasible to their lifestyle. So um, on this slide here, I listed not all, but some of the more important considerations that we often um take into account when working with our populations. So first, socioeconomic status. In the public health department, we're working with low-income families. So being very conscious um, of providing nutrition education and recommendations while recognizing budgetary constraints is very important. Um, also to the socioeconomic status, um, we it involves more than just budget. So we have to consider things like food access. Um, for example, do they live in a food desert? Um, transportation barriers and other limiting environmental factors. Um, in terms of how are you getting the message across? So it's our job to translate nutrition science into messaging that's e easily digested. Um, so we want to make sure that we are conscious of the literacy levels of our audience um, in terms of language barriers, making sure we have resources available in multiple languages um, whenever possible, having bilingual or multilingual um, staff or translation services. This helps us provide equitable access um, for all our participants and um, Dr. Bronstein alluded to earlier, one of the ways we could make sure we're addressing these things is by using pictures, right? If our um, language barriers is an issue, pictures is really a good way to get the message across. Um, we also work with diverse populations. Um, so looking into the cultural competency versus cultural humility aspects, um, not only is it important for us to be familiar with different cultures and practices and their traditions, um, cultural competency is often content oriented. So it's created for a group of people. However, 
it's important not to box people into one category because of their cultural background. So we also need to value people's individual experiences and desires. And finally, trauma-informed nutrition education. I'm sure many of us are familiar with this, but it's where we recognize the impact of trauma and adverse life and food-related experiences, um, the dietary behaviors and health impacts that result from these adversaries, adverse, oh, couldn't speak, and how to address them in an educational setting. And I have provided a handout um, in the resource section that really um, gives you good ideas and tips on how to um, take that approach when providing nutrition education. So next slide. Um, since I worked in or work in the CalFresh Healthy Living Program, I'll be speaking from this perspective and my experiences. Um, CalFresh Healthy Living is known as SNAP Ed. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, we provide community nutrition education. We use evidence based curriculums to deliver direct education to our eligible populations. And we also work with state and community entities to create policy systems and environmental changes um, to help transform communities by increasing access to healthy food, promoting healthy dietary choices, and expanding opportunities for physical activity. Next slide. So the education that we provide is informed by the dietary guidelines for Americans. Um, the dietary guidelines, if you don't know, they're updated every five years and they're grounded in robust scientific reviews on the current body of evidence. And um, they help provide key nutrition and health topics for each stage of life. Next slide. All right, so the entire DGAs is a little over 150 pages, but it can be summarized into these four simple steps. Um, so first, to follow a healthy dietary pattern at every life stage. Second, customize and enjoy nutrient-dense food and beverages um, that reflect your personal preferences, cultural traditions, and your budget. And third, um, meeting food group needs with nutrient-dense foods and beverages. And lastly, to limit foods and beverages that are higher in added sugars, saturated fat, and sodium, and limit alcoholic beverages. And um, since the DGAs are developed and written for a professional audience, um, like I said earlier, it's our job to translate the science. So we need to translate this information into actionable consumer messages and resources to help individuals and families. Um, my play is one example of a com consumer translation. So it was created um, to be used in various settings and adaptable to meeting personal preferences cultural food ways, traditions, and budget needs. All right, next slide. So I have a quick poll here based on the information um, you all have learned so far in this presentation and Dr. Bronstein's. Um, have you incorporated information on functional foods into your nutrition education? All right, so... 65% yes, it's a little not sure. So this is where um, we're really going to talk about next, how it all ties into each other. So next slide, Bailey, please. So going back to functional foods um, and what we know, so while there isn't a legal FDA definition, we've established that these are foods that are considered to have a more enhanced nutrition profile. They help promote growth and development. They can protect against disease and are mostly minimally processed foods. Um, and let's jump into the next slide. Okay, so how do we try tie in functional foods with the nutrition education we're providing? So again, in the earlier presentation by Dr. Bronstein, we established that in fact, most of us are already most likely eating functional foods. Um, this table is just a summary of how it all ties in. So we have um, 
if you're eating a healthy, balanced diet and using my plate as a guide to eat from the various food groups, you can easily incorporate functional foods into your diet and achieve these health benefits. So again, it's not a full list, but just to give you a glimpse of how it all relates. Next slide. Okay, so how are we identifying these? So when it comes to health claims, um, it could really be a whole webinar on its own, but since I think we're running low on time, um, I tried to summarize it as much as I can. So there are two types of health claims, authorized and qualified. Next slide. So our authorized health claims are, they're reviewed and approved by the FDA. The claims between the source and disease relationship, they're based on significant scientific agreement. Um, and they can't quantify the degree of risk reduction. And over here, I have an example of what that might look like. So um, adequate calcium and vitamin D as part of a healthful diet along with physical activity may reduce the risk of osteoporosis later in life. Next slide. In contrast, qualified health claims, they have some science to back it up, but not enough substantial evidence as authorized claims. They're still approved by the FDA, but they must acknowledge that the science is still emerging. For example, um, here we have cyan scientific evidence suggests but does not prove that whole grains as part of a low saturated fat, low cholesterol diet may reduce the risk of diabetes. Next slide. All right. Um, so whether you're a dietitian or a health educator, at some point or another, you will be asked questions that you may not know the answer to. Um, and it's always important to remember that while we know um, what's coming through with the science, where to go for credible information, that's more than likely not what our audiences are being exposed to, right? So the messaging they're getting is through probably through, you know, social media, celebrities, commercials, billboards, and we can't control the messaging, but we can teach others how to identify when a claim is a red flag and why. So I listed here um, just like quick ways to identify if a message is a red flag. Um, very simple. So if something promises a quick fix, it's usually a red flag. Um, typically, it's not a sustainable solution. Um, claims that categorize food into good versus bad. Um, for me, I think that this really um, perpetuates unhealthy eating behaviors and perceptions. Um, so next, too good to be true usually is. Um, and a few others on here, I won't go through them um, in too much detail, but on the next slide, we could talk a little bit about how to address these when they come up. All right, so when we're doing our nutrition classes, um, people always want to use the opportunity to ask us questions, right? Um, they're curious, which is great, um, but we may not always be prepared with the answer or know what the correct answer is. Um, but like I said, people will use the opportunity to ask questions. Um, I've had many instances where people want to ask disease specific questions. Um, and it's important to um, point out that it's not an appropriate setting to provide medical nutrition therapy. Um, as CalFresh Healthy Living dietitians, we're not allowed to at all. Um, and with good reason, right? So in a group setting to provide medical nutrition therapy, we don't know a person's medical history, you know, so it's not the greatest setting for that. And I always encourage people to talk to their provider if they have disease specific um, questions. Um, another thing to remember is that the curriculums and um, 
education were provided were designed for the public, right? The dietary guidelines for Americans. Um, and it focuses on public health. It's not a clinical guide for disease treatment. So always helpful to remind the class of that. Um, other times when we have questions and, you know, they see red flag messages, um, they could be based off of a one-off study um, and people don't know that, right? So we, they they don't know that, you know, maybe this should be looked into, maybe it should be a peer review, like is this article written, um, the science in it, was it based off of a peer reviewed study or not? Um, so things like that, just to keep in mind. Um, but with all that being said, we want to make sure that our participants' questions are valued, so reflecting and directing them to the correct information and thanking them for their contributions, because a lot of times it's not easy to speak up in a class setting, so we want to make sure that we appreciate them sharing their thoughts on a topic, but we want to stay on track, on time, um, and that's usually how I, you know, handle these types of situations. So on our last slide, um, I've linked some resources here. So the trauma-informed nutrition um, guidance, that's really, really helpful. A good summary of how to incorporate that into our nutrition education, CalFresh Healthy Living, um, the Dietary Guidelines for Americans, and also the Approved Health Claims by the FDA Authorized and Qualified. I don't have my contact information on here. I realized I should have put that in there, but thank you so much. I'm sure, Sonia, you could probably share it with the group. Yes, thank you, Rima. Yes. Or I could drop it in the chat. No, it's um, contact information contact information for our presenters uh, will be made available. So Rima, we do have you covered. Um, thank you, Rima, for just the valuable information that you shared on ways to apply that evidence-based information in a community setting and really also sharing tips for um, many of us who do work in that kind of community space in providing nutrition education to different audiences. Um, so thank you so much for just all the valuable information and um, best practices and tips. Um, just in the interest of time, um, we are going to move forward, but if you do have questions, I know there were some questions that came in. Thank you, Dr. Bronstein for addressing those. Thank you, everyone who, um, you know, is just sharing your thoughts, sharing your questions. Um, please feel free to do so for Rima and we could try to address those, um, towards the end of the presentation live or our, um, presenters can just um, respond and address that in the chat. So um, as Dr. Bronstein has. So thank you so much. Um, next slide, please. Okay, so for the next part of this webinar, um, we will all have the opportunity to participate in a community discussion. Um, this will be facilitated. And the purpose is to just delve further into the topic. Um, and we'll have about 10, 15 minutes to discuss your facilitator. Um, we'll take notes, or if someone is interested in scribing, we'll make that available. We'll be utilizing Jamboard. Um, so please feel free to use that as a way to kind of capture the group's thoughts, suggestions, ideas. Um, we'll be able to use that to report back. So the breakout rooms will be automatically assigned to you. And as um, you kind of just go into your breakout room, please consider, you know, how do you currently incorporate or plan to incorporate benefits and functional foods in your work? Um, next slide, please. Uh, but I would rem be remiss if um, I just didn't um, just recognize a very special partner who's with us today. So before we go into our breakout rooms, I'd like to just, you know, share we're really Delighted to collaborate with Cesar Sousa, uh, who's a registered dietitian for um, Altamed. He's a clinical nutrition manager, as well as a recipient of the 2023 Let's Eat Healthy Leadership Award. Um, Cesar will be supporting us with facilitating a breakout room. He is, uh, you know, he's a clinician. Um, he's work, he works with very diverse audiences across the Los Angeles County area, but he also has... Um, 
you know, a cultural inclusivity lens that he brings when he's engaging and educating um, Altamed patients. And that really adds tremendous value to today's conversation. So thank you, Cesar, for sharing your insight with us. Um, and in addition to Cesar, I'd like to thank our Dairy Council of California team who will also be supporting with facilitating. And uh, we will now go into our breakout rooms. Hello, everyone. Welcome back. Um, hopefully everyone enjoyed their um, just, you know, discussion and had a great opportunity to connect um, with, you know, some new people. Um, so now we would like to take the time to hear some highlights from um, just our discussion. We'll go ahead and start with room one. Um, so if you can please share one or two takeaways that were identified from your group, that would be great. It could be any, any, um, any question. That was. Um, I, I, I took some notes and uh, I had uh, Julie and Jessica and um, they said, well, one of the things that came out in a, a different conversation is make the learning fun. So that was that was something that was important, but provide the information in a digestible way that can be broken down for the population. Um, and people found it interesting to learn more. So those are some of the things that I, notes I took. Nice, wonderful. Um, um, room number two. Thank you, Dr. Bronstein. Yeah, so in room number two, um, one of the useful um, pieces of information that was shared was um, Dr. Bronstein's approach, um, focusing on what we can eat versus what we can't. Um, another thing that came up was functional foods are a lot more common than we think. And um, how do we plan, um, how do we use it currently or plan to use um, this information moving forward? We were, we actually had a teacher with us in our group. So we were sharing resources, CalFresh Healthy Living, Dairy Council um, resources that she can use in the classroom setting and just ideas um, that she can use because it's really, for me, it was really exciting to see an actual teacher, um, you know, just working with the kids. Cause I mentioned, we, we talk a lot with food service directors and the, you know, lunchroom setting, but working with the kids in the classroom also has, you know, a huge impact. So those were Thank the God. quick highlights from our group. <laughs> No, that's wonderful. Um, no, it, it it is. It's very important to think about kind of that individual level, how we're, you know, adapting and translating and communicating that information. Um, so that's wonderful to um, thank you, Rima, for just sharing those resources and just tools um, for that educator to, you know, continue being, you know, a nutrition champion. Um, room number three. Hello, everyone. So I had room number three. We had a little mixture of different people in the group. So we had someone working on the community, someone that's working in school, and myself coming more from the clinical side, more on the focus on m and I think all three of us came to kind of the agreement, which was already just said right now by Rima, is that there, there's a little bit too much of a focus on what not to eat and what to avoid, and not so much on highlighting what they're already consuming that, you know, has functional benefits. Just like Nadine said, uh, you know, everybody's already consuming these foods. So kind of the example that I gave my group is approaching it as like an onion. And sometimes you need to just talk with the person to get through these layers and you find out that they're already consuming a lot of these foods. So instead of really trying to get them to consume some new foods, really try to identify which ones they're already consuming that would provide them some benefits. And another uh, point was about students throwing away a lot of these foods that are providing the benefits for them and possibly because they don't know. So one thing we discussed as an idea is three bullet points that could be placed on top of the fruit or the vegetable on the lunch line so that they have a visual right then and there to give them something, you know, yes, they may still throw it away, but at least we're planting these little seeds, right? So ultimately it's about the messaging. So I think there's an opportunity for messaging. No, I really like that. That's a really good um, just example of ways that we can really look at the environment and find those opportunities. And sometimes it is just this, you know, those other kind of nutrition education promotion, promotion and messaging touch points that support that shift in that behavior um, or, 
even start to pique that interest and want to learn more and be curious. So um, thank you, Cesar. I really like that analogy of just like the onion, right? Peeling back the layers. Um, that's, you know, another good way to kind of just keep that perspective in mind as we're, you know, engaging um, with different audiences and having those, you know, conversations around, you know, nutrition and health. So um, thank you, Cesar. Um, room number four. <laughs> Okay, so our group, we agreed that the speakers did such an excellent job providing definitions of terms of like functional foods, pro and prebiotics, um, the different health claims like authorized versus qualified. So thank you so much. And we discussed how this information can be utilized in the community, how the community would be really receptive to learning more information about functional foods, both adults and children. And we love how Dr. Bronstein said people eat food, they don't eat nutrition. Um, and we also would love Dr. Bronstein's uh, recipe for her apple pear crisp, because that sounds really good. <laughs> if you have time, Dr. Bronstein. Room number five. Thank you, Sonia. So we talked about how the list of the functional foods um, that Rima put together was really helpful just for, you know, when working in the community and being able to provide kind of that connection and giving them a tool to be able to, you know, focus on those foods when they're at the grocery store. Um, and then also working in the communi community education space, oftentimes, you know, individuals are interested in learning more. Um, and that, and so there is the opportunity to take, to kind of incorporate some education on the functional health benefits because all food groups have functional um, health benefits. And then working in the WIC environment, um, the nutrition education is required. So there's the opportunity to connect some of these functional foods to the redeemable foods um, offered in the WIC package. And then lastly, just um, utilizing kind of more culturally um, relevant my plates and Kaiser has some of these um, just for different populations and also making that connection to these unique um, foods that different cultures um, incorporate on their my plate to the functional health benefit. A really great resource um something for you know us to kind of keep in mind especially if we're trying to kind of just be cognizant of the different audiences um that we're you know serving and providing education it's important to keep that um diversity equity and inclusion lens so um thank you bessie um for sharing that um and those takeaways room number six i That's believe me yes yeah. yeah. hi <laughs> Yeah, so we had um, perspectives from school health as well as school food. So on one hand, it's working on getting that farm fresh food into the school menus and really focusing on the menus. And like was mentioned earlier, highlighting the benefits of the foods that are in the menu and getting the kids excited about what they're eating um, on the menus. And then from the school health side, uh, you know, just bringing food awareness to the classrooms. Um, Betsy, you shared how you're just sort of getting into this role and you're passionate about increasing food awareness through parent workshops and through the classrooms and really highlighting a um, variety of foods by helping kids understand the food groups. And, you know, I loved how um, Dr. Bronstein highlighted just there are amazing foods in all the food groups and there's such variety. So, um, yeah, again, just that positive messaging and awareness. Group number seven. Okay, that would be me. So we had a small group, so we were able to have a very intimate conversation, but we found the presentations to be very informative and enlightening, especially the pieces on the probiotics versus prebiotics and the yogurt in different cultures. And then one way that we could get um, this to really resonate with the community is to have something printed for teachers to share with students. Um, or even community educators um, that are, you know, I know the room that I was in, um, we have someone from kind of the Riverside San Bernardino area, and she works a lot with, you know, the communities, the parents, um, the children, not so much in the school environment, but um, still in that same uh, vein of providing those kind of you know, resources that are turnkey for educators of all types, um, school and community. It's a really great point, Jamie. So we do want to spotlight just a few resources. Um, the first resource is the Food Matrix, uh, more than the sum of its nutrients from our partners at National Dairy Council, um, which explores the 
the food matrix. Um, and this focus is really on the physical structure of whole foods and the nutrients and bioactive factors that work together synergistically to um, impact health. It also highlights the dairy matrix. This is a great resource to learn more about um, the different matrices. So um, next slide. The second resource is from the Colorado State University uh, Extension, um, and it's a handout on functional foods for health. Uh, the resource um, kind of dives in on really defining functional foods um, and provides more information on the role of functional foods in health and um, diseases, as well as provides guidance on regulations around functional food claims. So it's a really nice um, handout that kind of summarizes uh, some of the information that Dr. Bronstein and Rima presented. Um, and the last one is um, a web page from FDA, which provides extensive information around authorized and qualified health claims in food labeling, um, as well as guidance on the significant scientific um, agreement standard and the, that clean process. So if this is an area that interests you, um, there is, um, you know, just a, a, a reputable um, web page and resource that you can access to learn more information. Uh, next slide, please. So um, we do want to thank you all for participating today. Um, a continuing education unit certificate has been made available, and um, we do want to take a moment to do a brief survey um, this will really help us improve future community of practices. Um, so we encourage everyone to take out your mobile device um, and scan the QR code. Um, we do have just a few more minutes, so we could take, you know, a minute or two to do the survey. And we can kind of just hold off. So I'll allow everyone just, you know, some time to do that if you can. Okay, well, um, we'll definitely be able to get the survey out if you did not get the chance to complete that. Um, but we do want to um, say, please save the date. Um, our next community of practice will be on Thursday, May 2nd, and we will feature information on the 2024 nutrition trends. Um, and as a reminder, a copy of today's webinar recording, as well as presentation slide evaluation link, and um, all the various different resources and um you know, links that were shared by our presenters will be emailed to all registered participants. Next slide, please. There is, um, this is just kind of a, a quick snapshot of the, you know, certificate. Um, we do have one that's a little bit more general and one for those in, um, you know, school nutrition. Uh, with those um, professional learning standard codes. I do want to share um, the contact information for our presenters today. I also want to thank, um, you know, uh, Cesar for supporting with the facilitation of our breakout and sharing his expertise. Um, and we want to kind of thank you all for joining us today. And okay, well, thank you, everyone. Um, and we hope to see you uh, May 2nd. So please save the date. Thank you.